We are in Amos, the second half of Amos tonight. So last week we did chapters 1 through 4. And just by way of review, and for those of you who weren't with us last week, Amos is unusual in many ways. First of all, he wasn't a prophet. And, and we're going to see tonight, he, he admits it. I'm not a prophet, God. I'm a farmer. I'm a shepherd. I'm a fig picker. Um, and he was from the southern kingdom. This is during that period of time when Israel was fractured into two kingdoms, two nations. He was from the southern kingdom. Uh, he called by God to travel all the way up north to preach to the people of Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom. And this is in the midst of a time when the Israelites were, these were the good old days for them. They were, they were at a period of peace and prosperity when everything seemed to be going great. And so they logically thought, well, God must be really pleased with us, otherwise we wouldn't be doing so well. And Amos shows up, this foreigner, this, uh, this southerner, who shows up and says, you got it all wrong. God is not pleased with you, and judgment is coming. So we looked last week at some of those things. This week we're going to look at chapters 5 through 9, the end of the book. And basically, for those of you who haven't been here for this series so far, what I'm doing is instead of a verse-by-verse study, we're just walking through select passages of each book so you get a flavor for what these books are about, what their teaching is, uh, so that you know these are books of the Bible we don't tend to read. You don't hear many sermons out of them. Uh, and, and so a lot of Christians just, well, I guess I'm aware there's a book called Amos, but they don't know what it means. So this helps us understand what the Word of God says, and what, so we have the full counsel of His Word. So let's start with chapter 5, verse 1. Hear, the, hear this word that I take up over you in lamentation, O house of Israel. Fallen no more to rise is the virgin Israel, forsaken on her land with none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city went out a thousand shall have a hundred left, and that which went out a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. So he starts out with that word fallen, and it's a lamentation. That's that's a term we don't use much. It literally means a funeral song, a song of mourning. This is something the Israelites did and we don't. We don't have lamentation songs. And no, country music doesn't count. Yeah, you may, you may listen to a song about my dog got run over, you know, my wife ran off or whatever. That's not the same thing. Imagine going to church and we just sing a song about, God, we don't know why this is happening. Lord, when are you going to show up? Father, I'm tired of seeing the evil succeed while I am destroyed. Can you imagine if that was the playlist of our hymns on this coming Sunday? And yet, you read the Psalms, which is the hymn book of Israel, and there's more of those kinds of Psalms, the Psalms of Lament, than there are of the ones we enjoy, like shout, to the, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth, and enter His gates with, with thanksgiving, and enter His courts with praise. There's actually more Psalms of Lament than there are Psalms of praise in the book of Psalms. So the Israelites understood that it's important for God's people to mourn together, just as important as it is for them to rejoice together. Now what Amos is doing here is he's basically presenting an original psalm of lament, a very short one, and he says, fallen. That word fallen is typically used when someone dies in battle. Someone dies before their time. An example is Jonathan, the son of Saul, David's best friend. Remember when Saul, Jonathan, and his brother all died in that, in that one battle uh, at the hand of the Philistines. And that's what David sang over Jonathan. Fallen, how, my, how the mighty are fallen, he says. Well, here, Amos's lamentation is not for a person and not for a hero, but for the whole house of Israel. And yet, there's still hope. Because look what he says next. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live But do not seek Bethel, and do not cross over into Gilgal, or cross over into Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into exile, and Bethel shall come to nothing. Again, we've talked about this before. One of the difficult things for us in the prophetic books is they mention all these place names, all these historic events that we may not be familiar with. Some of them are in Scripture, some of them aren't. In this this case, Bethel, Beersheba, Gilgal, those were all places in the northern kingdom that had become places of worship. 
So if you were a, a northern Israelite and you wanted to worship the Lord, you went to these places even though they weren't authorized by God. That's what you did because you didn't want to go down south to the temple in Jerusalem. That felt like treason. And God is saying, don't go to the, any of those places. I know that's what you and all your, all your neighbors are doing, but they're not really worshiping me there. But he says, if you, if you do turn back to me, if you do come back to the temple, make good sacrifices with a right heart, you're going to live, you're going to survive. He says in verse 6, Seek the Lord and live, lest He break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and it devour with none to quench it for Bethel. So there is still hope. And this is true of most Old Testament prophecies of judgment. Think of the, the prophecy that Jonah gave in Nineveh. Forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Was Nineveh overthrown? Not then, it wasn't. You know why? Because the Ninevites repented. So God's prophecies of judgment oftentimes are conditional. And this is, I believe, the case here. He's giving them a chance for hope. When my daughter Kaylee was very, very little, um, she's always loved animals, and, and she was very little, and so we thought, okay, she can handle fish. She can't, you know, that's, that's not much responsibility. So we bought her a bunch of fish. And, you know, this has always been her nature, very meticulous. So she named them all the first day, and she wrote up a little card. And each, each fish had a description. It says, you know, black uh, such and such fish with white stripes and, and the name of the fish. So with each fish, there was a, a, a description of the fish and then the fish's name, and she taped that card to the tank. So anytime any person walked up to the tank, they'd see it. And then they started dying. <laughs> Every day I'd come home from work and I'd see poor little Kaylee had crossed off another name off that card. It was the saddest thing. And eventually they were all gone. And it's our fault. We didn't do the research to find out there are certain things you got to do. There are certain ways you've got to treat the... Now, you might say that the, the people who sold us the fish should have told us this. We bought them at Walmart, so that should tell you something. Um, but we didn't give them the right kind of water to live in. Let's just put it that way. When it says, seek the Lord and live, the Lord is the only water we can live in. And you may be able to survive for a little while in the wrong water. You may, be, may even be able to convince yourself you're doing fine, like the Israelites were. Amos' job was he showed up and says, you're in the wrong water and you better get right because sooner or later your time is going to run out. So, chapter 5, verse 10. Here's where we're reminded of some of the reasons why God is angry at the Israelites. And this is one of the interesting things about Amos. Uh, many of the prophets, they focus on idolatry and the worship of false gods. Amos is more concerned with the way they treated other people. So verse 10 says, They hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor, and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you have not dwelt in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions, and how great are your sins, you who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, and turn aside the needy in the gate." So anytime in the Old Testament you hear the term the gate being used, it doesn't just mean the entrance of the city. The gate of the city was where legal business was done. So you talk about the elders at the gate. Those were the men of the city who, uh, I don't know if they were elected or just sort of by acclamation everyone said, they're the wisest men in the city. They sit by the gate and if anybody has a legal case, they come to them. And the problem in Israel was that the people in the gates of the cities were not rendering true verdicts. They were not doing justice. You could not get justice in Israel in that place unless you had the right amount of money. And you might say, well, isn't that the way the world works? Yeah, in many places it is, but that's not the way God intended for His people to operate. And He was angry about it, that there was no justice in Israel. And so, in fact, it was so bad, verse 13, it says, Therefore he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. It's a confusing verse because it makes it sound like Amos is saying, if you're wise, you won't say anything about this stuff. The only way I can make sense of this, and I've seen other commentaries that this is the way they interpret it, is Amos is just saying things are so bad that anybody who in ordinary circumstances would stand up and blow the whistle, Anybody who in ordinary circumstances would stand up and tell the truth and say, this isn't right, we need to change, they're all hiding. 
because they know they'll get killed. They'll get, at best, run out of town. So in other words, Amos is, in essence, quoting the people of Israel saying, if you're smart, you'll keep your mouth shut and just go along. That's the way things are in Israel right now. And I think all of us have seen and some of us have experienced maybe a, a corporate environment like this, or maybe, a, maybe you've lived in a town where the, the local government was that way. Uh, maybe you've even seen it on higher levels, but we know what it is when there's corruption, when there's injustice, and no one will speak out because the cost of speaking out is too high. And that's what was going on in the nation of Israel. should never be true among the people of God. Now here's one of the more famous parts of the book, and starting with verse 18. In fact, when you get to verse 24, I think it's the most famous verse in the book of, of Amos. But let's start with verse 18. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. Remember a few weeks ago, we, we looked at the book of Joel, and we said that's the theme of the book of Joel, the day of the Lord. The Israelites use the term day of the Lord to mean, okay, the day when God shows up on earth and punishes our enemies and frees us from all our bonds. And Joel said to them, watch out, because when God shows up on earth, he's going to have some problems with you too. And that's what Amos is saying here too. So the day of the Lord is not just the day of judgment at the end of time. It's any time God comes down and personally intervenes in human affairs. He says, don't be so eager to see God get involved because when he does, he's going to take you to task as well. So li listen to these images that Amos gives. It's very, you, you, this doesn't sound like a blue collar guy. This sounds like somebody who uh, had spent some time reading books and knew his way around the, the language. He says, uh, it is darkness and not light as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Or he went into the house and leaned his hand against a wall and a serpent bit him. It's the picture of you can't get away from it. You run from that lion and you think, oh, thank God I made it. And there's a bear waiting for you in your house, right? This is the picture of the day of the Lord. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? And then he switches, switches uh, topics. He starts to attack their worship. He says in verse 21, I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. Can you imagine, can you imagine if somebody said that on Sunday morning at First Baptist Church? God doesn't want to hear these songs. These songs are terrible. They're an abomination. God doesn't want to hear that sermon. That sermon is a mockery of His good name. And that's what Amos is saying. Your worship that you're so proud of, God finds it repulsive because it comes from a heart of a group of people that has taken advantage of their neighbors, that's not treating others the way they should. As we've always said, it's, it's the way you treat others from sat Monday to Saturday that determines how good your worship is going to be on Sunday. And here's what it leads to, verse 24. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Now, because of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, that's probably the most famous verse in the whole book because he quotes it there. In fact, he quoted it several times in his ministry. Um, but what it's saying is, it's again, it's about the way we treat others, especially others who can't take care of themselves. Justice and righteousness... When you look at them in the Old Testament, essentially mean the same thing. They're used interchangeably. Now there you can, you can find some subtle differences, but, but essentially they're the same. Justice and righteousness are both ultimately about how we treat others. So let me give you some examples. Psalm 82 verse 3 says, Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and destitute. And then on the righteousness side, there's Proverbs 29, 7. Just one of many examples. It says, a righteous man knows the rights of the poor. A wicked man does not understand such knowledge. So justice and righteousness means you go out of your way to look out for those who can't take care of themselves. And you make sure you're not trampling on someone else's rights. You're not hurting someone else's ability to take care of themselves. Now, let me just say something in terms of the American church today, and it's, it's been this way for at least the last hundred years. The, about a hundred years ago, the American church, uh, American Protestant church, I should say, divided into two camps. 
And there was one camp that said, you know, you know we're, we're enlightened now and we're not really into all this convincing people that you got to believe in Jesus or you go to hell when you die. So what it really means to follow Jesus is to take care of the poor and to take care of those who are marginalized. And so we're about, salvation is about taking care of the body, but not the soul. And then on the other hand, there was the other camp, and at the time they were called fundamentalists until that word began to mean something else, and then it became evangelicals, and those were the ones that said, you know, we're not going to worry so much about the body because it's only temporary. We're going to focus on saving people's souls. And the shame of it is that God cares about both. When you read His Word, God cares about both. So we need to recognize that. Amos is one of those who very strongly advocates for don't come in and preach what you think is the gospel if you're not living the, the living gospel during the week and taking care of those who are hurting. So uh, that's the end of the first part of Amos all the way through chapter 6. We won't read any of chapter 6, but I want to get to chapters 7 through 9 because at that point Amos shifts gears and starts to just tell us the visions that he had. And we don't know when these happened, if they happened before he went to Israel. Maybe these were the things when he was tending sheep and, fi and picking figs that spurred him on. Or maybe while he was in Israel, he had these visions. But he has a series of five visions, and then we get an interpretation of them. And a couple of other events happen in the midst of this. So chapter 7, verse 1, the first vision. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, he was forming locusts when the latter growth was just beginning to sprout. And behold, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. When they had finished eating the grass of the land, I said, O oh Lord God, please forgive. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. So the first vision is he sees God getting a literal horde of locusts to send on Israel. We've taught, we talked when we looked at Joel about how devastating that would be. And Amos specifies it was during the latter growth after the king's mowings. What that means is after the king has already mown the grass to make hay for his own animals, the rest of the people, then they have to let the grass grow back up so they can get their own. Well, before that's even happened, God's about to send the locusts to eat up all the grass. So there won't be anything for the animals. The animals will die. There will be no meat for the people. And that's the first vision Amos has. And he immediately prays and intercedes. And God lets Moses, I mean Moses, God's, God lets Amos' prayer save the day. You know, like we said a couple weeks ago, it's not that God changes his mind. God's never wrong. But God let Moses' prayer be the one that brought about repentance, that brought about salvation for the people. And then the second vision comes right after that in verse 4. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord God was calling for a judgment by fire, and it devoured the great deep and was eating up the land. So this is not just a, a, a fire like a forest fire. This is a, a drought because it talks about eating up the great deep. The waters start to recede, and there's no, there's no water for the land. And then I said, O oh Lord God, please cease. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. Jacob, again, is another name for Israel. The Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be, said the Lord God. Now verse 7, here's the third vision. This is what He showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing by a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in His hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So a plumb line, for those of you that don't know, is a string with a weight tied at the end of it. You use it to measure whether a wall is straight. You, know, you, lay, you put the, the string up against one side of it, and if the rock sways out from the wall, that means the wall is leaning. Um, and, and God is setting a plumb line against the nation of Israel. He's going to put them to judgment. He's going to show, here's where you've gone off track and I'm going to destroy you. My brother is an architect, and he's told me stories uh, that make me glad I'm not an architect about times when uh, he has to deal with building contractors, and, and there will be a time when they've built a whole bunch of stuff, and he comes and looks at it and says, that's not what I drew. And they say, well, isn't it close enough? And he has to say, no, it's not. 
well, we got to tear it up and start all over. Well, I'm sorry, but you've got to do it. I, 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 just, I can't give this to, and, and he says, you know, the, the thing they don't realize is I have to answer to the customer. You know, I can't go to the customer and say, okay, yeah, we got it done, when they'll look at it and say, that's not what I ordered. And, and so I think about that when I look at this passage. I think about, about God saying, I, I know this sounds harsh, but your worship is no good. Your worship is not up to my standard. Because that's what he's talking about. The high places will be made desolate. The sanctuaries will be laid waste. And that's, that ends, that's what ends up happening. And you notice on this, in this vision, there's no opportunity for Amos to pray for their salvation. God's already decided. It's already set. The sanctuaries will be made desolate. The high places will be laid waste. Now, there's a little interlude because something happens uh, that we didn't see coming. And that's in verse 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, the king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. This land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. By the way, you would think it would be, put, you're putting yourself in a precarious position. If you go into a nation and say, this is all going to be destroyed, the king is going, to, is going to be killed, the land is going to be conquered, people would say, that's treason. And it is, unless God told you to say it. Verse 12, And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. So all things considered, that's a pretty mild rebuke. I mean, he didn't threaten him. He didn't throw him in jail. He didn't order him to be killed. All he said was, just go home and talk to those people. You don't have any business up here. Go to your own people and prophesy to them. Verse 14, Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock. And the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy of Israel against Israel and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall be a prostitute in the city and your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword and your land shall be divided up with a measuring line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land and Israel shall surely go into exile away from its land. Now, does that seem like to any of you like a little bit of an overreaction? You know, all, all Amaziah said was, you know, you might want to go home and, and preach this message to them. You're not really welcome here. And Amos says, your wife's going to be a prostitute and your sons are going to die. And it does sound very harsh. That's Amos. But you have to understand what's going on here. This is not just about a personal conflict between a priest and a prophet. This is a question of authority. Who's really in charge and who's, whose authority really matters? See, to Jeroboam, the king, all that matters is what he wants. He's the king. He's used to getting his way. And that's one of the problems with people who get a certain level of power is they get used to having their way and they don't like to be questioned. To Amaziah, all that really mattered was pleasing his boss. His boss is the king. Now, it shouldn't be that way because he's a priest of God, but that's his operating principle. I just have to please my boss and my boss is the king. But to Amos, it was about pleasing the Lord. And when you attack me, Amos says, you're attacking God because I'm preaching His Word. I'm giving you what God said to say. And if you tell me to get out of town, you're rejecting the Word of the Lord. And I have to be honest with you, that's not going to go well for you. So, vision number four is in chapter 8, verse 1. I'm reading a lot of scripture here. Uh, verse 1, this is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, a basket of summer fruit... And he said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The songs of the temple will become wailings in that day, declares the Lord God. It's a, it's a basket of summer fruit because what he's saying is, Israel is ripe for destruction. The time is ripe. You think that a basket of summer fruit would be a good thing. Oh, abundance and glory. No, that's not what the vision means. It means the time is ripe. Now is the time. I've warned them long enough. They've had long enough to repent. The time is up. 
Now they're going to pay. And he goes on and, and repeats some of the same reasons. You sell the poor. Uh, you trample on the needy. You sell grain on the Sabbath. You're, you're doing things in the wrong way. Uh, let's go on to verse 9. And on that day declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the mourning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. Now, that should perk your ears up as a New Testament Christian, right? Because you know that on the day of the Lord's crucifixion on Good Friday, the sun went down at noon. didn't go down, but the sun went dark for three hours at noon. Broad daylight, there was darkness over the land for three hours. And then this idea of mourning for an only son. Jesus is the only son of God. And we know that the New Testament writers looked at that and said, aha, that's, that's one of those little clues that God left in the Old Testament to say, here's what's going to happen. And we as Christians, when we read these passages, we have to remember, yes, those are in there as prophecies for us. They're, they're ways of saying God had the cross in mind all along. But to the people who first heard them, they didn't know that. And so we have to read prophecies like that in two ways. We have to read them as prophecies of the future. But also we have to see if you were living in Israel when Amos was alive, what you knew was these are words that mean destruction. Because in that culture, I mean, anybody who loses a child, it's a tragedy. I don't know anybody who's ever lost a child who doesn't say, I'd rather have died a thousand deaths than lose my child. But to lose an only son in that culture wasn't just sad. It meant you had nobody to take care of you when you got older. And if you were a widow, you were really in trouble because you couldn't earn money for yourself. And that only son was your only means of care. So to lose an only son means you've lost everything. And that's what Amos is saying is you're about to lose everything. This country is going to be, I mean, this country that has so much and thinks they're so blessed, overnight it's going to go to nothing, go to absolutely nothing. Uh, let's pick up with chapter 9. Oh, I, let me, I haven't finished. Verse 11. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. Isn't it interesting? This is a people who hasn't been listening to God. They've been listening to their accountants. They've been listening to their advisors. And they've been listening to the priests who just told them what they wanted to hear. They haven't been listening to God. But suddenly when God stops speaking, they're going to miss His voice. And they're going to run all around saying, God, where are you? We, we, we're asking you questions. Why aren't you speaking? And His answer is going to be, you know, I tried. For a thousand years I tried and you didn't listen. I'm giving you what you wanted. You wanted me out of your business? I'm out of your business. And historically we see that after Malachi and until John the Baptist, there's 400 years or so where, as far as we know, there's no prophetic voice. And that's how people heard from God back then. If you didn't hear from a prophet, you didn't hear God. And so this, I, I believe that's what Amos is talking about, this famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Now let's move on to chapter 9. And we've got a couple more passages to look at, and then we're done. Vision number 5, fifth and final vision in verse, verse 1. I saw the Lord standing beside the altar. The fifth vision is you see the actual uh, Shekinah glory standing beside the altar in the temple. And he said, strike the capitals until the thresholds shake and shatter them on the heads of all the people. And those who are left of them I will kill with the sword. Not one of them shall flee away. Not one of them shall escape. He pictures the temple of the Lord, the one in Jerusalem, collapsing and all the people with it. You know, as if, as if the whole nation is crammed in there worshiping and the temple collapses on top of them like that like the temple of Dagon collapsed on the Philistines in the book of Judges. So it's not something he's saying is going to literally happen. He's saying, God's, this is going to be the destruction of my people. That's what's coming. Verse 2, if they dig into Sheol, which is the Hebrew word for the grave, from there my hand shall take them. If they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. If they hide themselves on top of Carmel, from there I will search them out and take them. And if they hide from my side at the bottom of the sea, 
There I will command the serpent, and it shall bite them. If they go into captivity before their enemies, then I shall command the sword, and it shall kill them. And I will fix my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. So this is not good news. This is, this is God saying, you can't escape the judgment. It's coming. It is coming for you. Um, it, it just represents, the, the fact that God rep, uh, pictures it as being inside the temple is just a representation of the way false religion has led to the destruction of the land. The people of God have been led astray by their religious leaders. And as a religious leader myself, that's a very humbling thing to hear. So let's finish up because there's good news. Aren't you glad? There's actually a happy ending to the book of Amos. Chapter 9, verse 11. In that day I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord God who does this. So the booth of David... Uh, see, you, you may recall that earlier the king of the nation was considered the house of David. And it would talk about you know, all the people from the house of David. And this guy came after this guy, you know, David and then Solomon and then Rehoboam and so forth and so on. Well, now it's just the booth of David. Remember, there was a, a feast every year, the Feast of Booths, Tabernacles, where they would make these little, little uh, wooden huts and they'd live in them for a while to remember about... Uh, their days in the wilderness. This is Amos' way of saying the house of David has become just a little shack, just a tent. But God's going to revive it. God's going to bring it back. And, and, and when he says that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that are called by my name, believe it or not, that's actually quoted in Acts 15. James, the brother of our Lord, quotes that passage you remember what's happening in Acts 15. Uh, there's this big conference among all the, the Christian leaders in the early church, and you've got the people there who say, hey, God's done this amazing thing. He's spreading the gospel among non-Jews all over the Greek world. And then you've got the others who are hardliners who say, well, they can't come to Christ before they first become Jews. they got to get themselves circumcised and accept our faith and, and follow all the law. And then when we approve of them, then they can be baptized. And there's a decision to be made about, okay, which way will it go? And that's a very big decision. And James, the brother of our Lord, quotes this verse to say, you know, God had it all along in mind that all the nations would come to Him. All the nations of the earth. Yeah, we all ought to say amen because we're all part of those nations that God grafts in to His, to his branch. Okay, so finish up verse 13. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. I love the picturesqueness of this, that you know the, the land is going to be so fruitful that you won't even be through planting the crops and somebody will be coming up behind you harvesting them, right? Uh, you, won't even, you won't even be through uh, sowing the seed for the grapes and somebody will be there to tread them and, and to make wine out of them. He says, the mountains shall drip sweet wine and the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. Now clearly, this is not talking about something that's happened yet. There are a lot of prophecies in the Old Testament that talk about it's going to be great when God brings His people home from exile. And God did that 70 years after they went away into exile. And that was a miracle because that, that didn't happen in the ancient world. Once you got sent into exile, you were done. You either died or you became part of that new people. And so bringing them home was a miracle that was prophesied in Scripture. But they didn't come home to a place where the, the hills were flowing with sweet wine. I mean, they came back to a destitute country that they had to rebuild a little bit at a time. So what is this talking about? It's talking about the new Jerusalem. It's talking about the new earth, the, the land to come. It's talking about when the son of David is king forever. And that's what we all have to look forward to. That's what we all have to look forward to, a world where the frustrations of this life and the way everything in creation seems to be working against us, including our own hard-headedness will no longer be in the way.
and he will be our God and we'll be his people. We'll have abundance, there will be plenty, and we'll have security because we know it will never end. No matter how bad we mess up, we won't be able to mess it up.